<laughs> All right, let's turn to some actual journalism. Here is the latest <laughs> from the Gray Zone. Here's the headline. Bombshell filing 9-11 hijackers were CIA recruits. At least two 9-11 hijackers had been recruited into a joint CIA-Saudi intelligence operation that was covered up at the highest level, according to an explosive new court filing. This is by the Gray Zone's Kit Clarenberg. So, Max, talk to us about this story. Yeah, let me pull this up because I, I want to um, refer to it. But this is something that – this is an episode that I wrote about in the management of savagery. And we've now gained new insights and shocking new details. Actually, I wouldn't even say it's shocking. I would say our worst fears about this particular episode have been seemingly confirmed uh, through a 2021 court filing, which was just released, um, which came in the form of a 21-page declaration by the lead investigator of the Office of Military Commissions, which is overseeing the cases of the 9-11 defendants. His name is Don Canestraro. And he had interviewed several FBI agents who were involved in investigating 9-11 and seeking actually to prevent the attack in the months leading up to the attack. So basically... This relates to two of the hijackers, the so-called muscle hijackers who were charged with um, overwhelming the, one of them was a muscle hijacker, overwhelming the passengers and getting to the cockpit. The other one was a pilot. Uh, Khalid al-Midhar and Nawaf al-Hazmi. These were Saudi citizens who had attended a Al-Qaeda, they called it like a mega summit. And it was a gathering of top Al-Qaeda figures in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, back in January, 20, in January 2000. Now, during that summit, which, again, it was a major Al-Qaeda summit. During that summit, CIA agents broke into the hotel room of Al-Hazmi and Al-Midhar on January 5th and January 8th and photographed their passports. They were being monitored by the CIA. The CIA knew they were there and they knew that something was being planned, something like the day of planes attack, which was already within the, kind of in the pipeline that was heavily monitored by US, Pakistani intelligence, all sorts of intelligence services. So Al-Hazmi and Al-Midhar were able to then, following this summit, from Malaysia, board a direct flight to LA International Airport, get off the flight without any screening, and then be met at the airport by Omar Al Bayoumi, Omar Bayoumi, who was posing as an employee of the Saudi Civi Civil Aviation Authority and was in fact a Saudi intelligence officer, who then took these two characters, Al Qaeda figures, to an apartment paid for their lease, and then arranged for them to receive rides in taxis to flight lessons while shepherding them to and from local Saudi-sponsored mosques. This should have set off alarm bells everywhere, but the CIA refused to tell the FBI that they, these figures were in the country. The CIA was operating through a shady unit known as Alex Station, which had been set up in tandem with the FBI, but which operated outside the FBI's purview and was a, essentially a black operation charged with the ability to recruit assets. And so not only did the CIA refuse to tell the FBI about these two would-be hijackers in the U.S., they forbade FBI agents assigned to Alex Station from telling other FBI agents. Why would they do that? Why would they be so determined to avoid the detection of these two dangerous figures as they were being shepherded through the US by Saudi intelligence? Well, it's clear now, as was everyone suspected through Don Canestraro's filing, that they had been recruited by the CIA and were CIA assets, whether they knew it or not, and that Omar Bayoumi, the Saudi intelligence agent, was himself a CIA asset working in a U.S.-Saudi joint intelligence operation. And this raises a lot of questions, which we'll get to, but here's the 
the um, statement of an agent known simply as C3 in this filing said that Bayoumi's contact with the hijackers and his support thereafter was done at the behest of the CIA through the Saudi intelligence service. And the explicit purpose of Alex Station was to, quote, recruit Al-Hazbi and Al-Midhar via a li liaison relationship. And so as Kit Clarenberg details in this excellent article, which really puts all of this into context, the FBI was not told about Al-Midhar and Al-Hazmi's presence in the U.S. or the fact that I think one of them was actually the roommate of the lead 9-11 hijacker, Mohammed Atta, at one point, which would have just wrapped up the whole operation until the operation was in its final stages and they had already gone to New York. Uh, and in, at, even at that point, it was not made a law enforcement investigation, which would have necessitated arrests. It was simply an intelligence investigation, which necessitated nothing more than surveillance. So the C you can just point a finger directly at Langley, at the CIA, and at Alex Station and say, you are responsible for letting 9-11 happen. That is the most conservative analysis we can put forward. But we can also raise certain questions about this. Max, you know, this reminds me of another episode you read about in the management of savagery, which is the Manchester bombing in the UK, where the MI5 had basically worked with the bomber uh, involved and not properly alerted authorities to his presence. And uh, that failure set in stage the events that l led that bombing to happen, like the, bo the, the bombing at the Ariana Grande concert. Is that a well, fair this, comparison? this happens all the time. I mean, this happens all the time when assets are recruited and then they're protected by the intelligence services. Um, we've seen it in bombings in Germany and France too, that they all, they uh, often had prior contact with the intelligence services and it gets swept under the rug. In the case of Salam Abedi, who was the Manchester bomber responsible for the worst terror attack in, I believe in British history, just ripping to shreds uh, close to 20 young girls at a concert. He was trained with ISIS in Syria. And before that, he worked with his father, Ramadan Abedi, who is an MI5 asset from Manchester on the battlefield in Libya to overthrow Gaddafi. And the MI5 had been maintaining this community of Libyan expats, exiles in Manchester as one of their anti-Gaddafi cards. And then once the uh, dirty war in Libya began, the insurgency, they just turned them loose. They all got special visas to leave, exit visas to go to Libya. And when it was all over, Salam Abedi and his father were picked up by a British Royal Navy boat in Libya and taken home. I mean, it was that clearly a British operation. And so with those tactics and the ideology that he absorbed in Syria and Libya, he then went and targeted his own neighbors, his own countrymen. So uh, we're going to have more on the Manchester bombing at the Gray Zone. But back to this, this story, I mean, the, it was all covered up at the highest level uh, for years and years, and we were, we're only getting these details now. And then the personnel who oversaw this operation at Alex Station were promoted, uh, including the uh, FBI... The, 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 the FBI person who was placed inside Alex Station, who did not tell other FBI personnel about Al-Midhar and Al-Hazmi's presence inside the U.S., Dina Corsi, she's been promoted. I think she's like the deputy director of counterintelligence for the FBI, and she was actually in touch with Pete Strzok during the whole Operation Crossfire Hurricane episode when this FBI unit was actually trying to stir up an investigation of Donald Trump over uh, Russian collusion. So she's still there. Then you have, yeah, de she's deputy assistant director for intelligence. If you look at her LinkedIn page and then um, you have um, the, the, the successor of the first head of Alex station. The first head is named Richard Blee. His successor was Alfreda Francis B Bukowski. Um, who joined the CIA's operations division and was a really influential figure in the war on terror, as Kit Clarenberg writes. And he actually 
oversaw the quote unquote enhanced interrogations or torture of 9-11 suspects, which influenced heavily the Senate Intelligence Committee's report. Uh, well, no, the Senate Intelligence Committee's report found that Bukowski was a key player in this, this torture program. And what was the point of the torture program? It was to extract confessions that would essentially back up the official narrative. Our understanding of 9-11 is heavily influenced by the confessions of suspects who were placed under heavy duress through torture overseen by Bukowski. So you understand the double, the, the, the conflict of interest there or the corruption there is that Bukowski is able to cover up what Alex Station did by fueling the entire narrative by forcing, presumably forcing suspects to say what he wanted. I mean, this is just insane levels of corruption that we're talking about. And uh, so it raises questions. I mean, I think, you know, it raises this piece went viral and many people want to draw the most conspiratorial conclusion possible, which is that the CIA directed the 9-11 attacks in some form. Then there's the conclusion that could be drawn that the CIA allowed the 9-11 attacks to go forward in order to create space to advance uh, the goals of the neocons and militaristic hardliners across the Middle East who needed a what Paul Wolfowitz called months before 9-11, a, cata a catalyzing event. Uh, and then you could just simply draw the conclusion, the most conservative in conclusion, which is that the CIA was so desperate to get sources inside Al-Qaeda and penetrate this organization that they were willing to overlook all of the warning signs that a massive attack was about to take place. And prevent the FBI from knowing about it and then cover its own tracks. So one of those three conclusions or all three or some combination of them is true. And I wonder where this leaves the 9-11 families who have been trying to seek answers about the, you know, Saudi Arabia's role in 9-11 for years. There was that release of those missing pages uh, recently, but even those pages were still redacted. And I wonder if those redactions have to do with some of the disclosures that were made here in this in this court filing. Yeah, I mean, they, they've been forgotten. The 9-11 families have been sort of forgotten. And Obama, under Obama, I think a law was passed to prevent them from suing the Saudi government. It's right. passed in the Senate. Yeah. So, yeah. And the whole 9-11 attack has been placed in the rearview mirror. Um, I'm looking forward to the cover-up investigation of the creation of the next pandemic. I don't know when that's going to take place, but I mean, we're just so deluged in psyops that this has just been swept under the rug. But what the point that I want to make and the conclusion I want to take away is that every step of the way from 9-11 through the entire history of Al-Qaeda there has been the hand of the CIA directing it, influencing it, supporting it, training it, or just simply paving the pathway for Al Qaeda to transform into from this local organization that was fighting the Soviets in Afghanistan to a global organization. And so we're talking about from 1979, when Zbigniew Brzezinski laid this so-called bear trap for the Red Army in Afghanistan by arming, you know, working with the CIA to arm the Mujahideen, which allowed bin Laden to come in and start the Services Bureau and Peshawar and begin bringing the foreign fighters in who then got their training and then moved abroad. From there to 9-11, which completely reshaped American politics in the worst way possible, to the Syrian dirty war in which Al-Qaeda's rebranded uh, new entity I don't even know what it's called, the Salvation Front. It was called Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, but it's really Al-Qaeda in Syria. They control, they still control the northwestern province of Idlib. Uh, so this, and that was a complete NATO operation. So that's the conclusion that I want to draw. That's what the management of savagery is about. And we're still getting the details to fill in these uh, disturbing these to, to, to fill in these disturbing outlines.